Welcome to Tea with Jess. I'm author Jess Montgomery, and I'm delighted you're joining me for a little tea break. As Nana says in my Kinship Mystery Series, life is hard, have tea. And today's mug is a, my favorite, very faded <laughs> old mug from uh, that I got a gift with a uh, subscription to Writer's Digest years ago. I've described it before, but it's it's got a writer who uh, is at his typewriter and in his thought bubble, it says tap, 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 tap. And in the thought bubble for the typewriter, it just says tap. And at the bottom, it says delusions of grandeur, um, which uh, I think is pretty funny and is um, kind of how I see writing and editing, which today I'm welcoming Tiffany Yates Martin, who is, I have to say, um, an editing genius. Her insights into editing and revision, specifically how those practices can shape a first draft from a lump of clay into a unique and compelling script sculpture, uh, are career changing for writers. It certainly was for this writer. Uh, Tiffany helped me with the first draft of The Widows and part of uh, The Hollows, the second book in the Kinship series. She helped me take those to the next level. And I'm still and will always apply the lessons I learned from working with her to my writing. And she runs Fox Print Editorial, wrote the book Intuitive Editing, which I regard as a must have. Let me grab my copy to prove I mean it, a must have. <laughs> uh, for every writer at any stage. And she uh, walks the walk, or maybe I should say she writes the write, because she writes terrific novels about love, relationships, family under a pen name, Phoebe Fox. So I'm delighted to welcome Tiffany today to Tea with Jess. So Hi. welcome, um, Tiffany. Hello. That was a really <laughs> very generous introduction. Thank you. You're very welcome. I'm I'm delighted to have you here. Should, I love share. getting to talk to you directly. Yes, I don't directly. think I don't know if authors probably they do, but um, they may not realize how intimate an editorial relationship can be with someone that you've never actually talked to face to face. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's an incredible leap of trust, and uh, I'm yeah. glad I made that leap with you. So I loved share, working with share you. Share your oh, thank you. Share your mug. What what is your oh, mug today? Uh, this is the mug I use every single day. It's oh. uh, it's mugs by Mara, and it's so I, I guess they're sort of mass produced. But when I first found this mug, it was in a little shop in uh, Utah where I was oh. for a wedding. And I bought this one and another one, but this one was my very favorite for years and years. And then it broke. Yeah. And I thought it was like a one of a kind artist's mug. But I remembered that on the bottom, it says Mara, M-A-R-A. -A. And so I started searching online and it turns out now they're mass, they're mass produced. There's a huge, you can order them at all these places. So I didn't care because it has the perfect hand feel uh -huh. and it contains the perfect amount of Coffee. Sorry, I'm cheating a little bit. Okay. Uh, so yeah, and it's heavy. Like I love the weight yeah. of it. It feels very portentous. Yeah, <laughs> it, it looks substantive. And there's a fish on it. And the fish is so cute. And I love the beach. So that is all good stuff. And these and colors, I, I think, are just yum. Oh, yeah. We've oh, got teal. Sorry. We've got royal blue. I'm kind um, of digging between your backgrounds and mine that we're kind of covering the full spectrum of color. <laughs> That's right. I've got <laughs> teal, bright green, aqua. I um, love it. <laughs> um, and I love to fish. So, um, so that's I right. I forgot. Fish. While I'm just admiring them, you're sitting there killing them and eating them. <laughs> <laughs> I throw them back. I throw them back. I'm teasing. Uh, I think they're delicious, uh, also. I do too. But and I love that you fish. I think that's so cool. You fly <laughs> fish, right? No, no. I just, I just cast fish. Okay. I just have a rod and reel. So, yeah. Um, well, and it, the fish mug is appropriate also because this is so cheesy, but I love a good cheesy pun. We want to hook our readers. Oh, so. I was hoping you were going to say that. <laughs> That's good. I never thought of that. Yeah. Literally never thought of that, yeah, but it's we the perfect hook our readers. editing writing mug metaphor. Yeah. It's my metaphorical mug. It's a metaphorical mug about hooking readers. Um, so let's talk about that. First, I, tell us what inspired you to become an editor. <laughs> um, so I was an English major because I knew I loved it. 
but uh, I didn't know that you could do anything with that. It was just the quickest way out of school at that point. <laughs> um, and I had no idea. Well, I did have an idea what I was going to do. I thought I was going to be an actor and I was an actor at the time. And I moved to New York and I was acting and uh, waiting tables, like pretty much every other actor. And A, didn't want to wait tables forever and B, wanted to not live like a starving artist while I was breaking into acting. Mm -hmm. uh, so I found this, I love telling this story because it's so silly. In the New York Times, there was an ad in the classified section that said, get paid for reading books, send us $25 and we'll, we'll, we'll tell you how. And I'm like, mm -hmm. <laughs> I was sure it was a scam. And at the time I was so poor that my, like what I ate was care packages from home and, Aww. you know, like a, a side of brown rice from the Chinese restaurant with soy sauce on it. This is what oh I could gosh. afford. So it was a fortune for me, but I did it. And sure enough, it was actually full of great information on how to learn to be a proofreader and a copy editor and approach uh, the big publishers, which at the time, <laughs> this was pre-internet kids. So I, um, <laughs> there was this giant, and when I say giant, I'm not kidding, this book called The Literary Marketplace. Do you remember it? it like, oh, yeah. This thick. And you yeah. couldn't check it out. You had to go to the library reference right. desk and sit there all day. But that's mm -hmm. where I got the names of the managing editors. Oh, and wow. I approached them all. And I put together a resume, luckily having majored in this and been pretty much a word nerd all my life. Um, I knew I could do the work. So they sent tests. And then one led to another led to another because publishing is a small industry. And I ended up mm -hmm. copy editing for most of the big six at the time while I was right. in New York. And then I quit acting because um, that was futile. Um, <laughs> and it just became no fun anymore. So yeah. I realized I was really loving this and I transitioned into doing some journalism. And then about maybe 12 years ago, I thought, I started to think I could do developmental editing just based on, by that point, I had been working with hundreds hundreds of manuscripts and you see everything that's been done to that point because again pre-internet kids um all the changes back then were made you know literally on the pages in red pencil right and then and you got to see especially if you were proofreading you got to see the final version and the original our uh, author's version how it all evolved what made it into the final pages what the edits looked like so i felt like that was really good training ground mm -hmm. and i started it but i had no credentials but i happened to know an author here who i had copy edited for who was struggling with her current novel manuscript and she said um I said to her, how do you feel about me doing a developmental edit for you? And I'll do it for free. And what does she have to lose? Right. And so said, it, went, yes, of course. it went really well. And she bless her. She told all the authors that she knew and that started to snowball. And here we are. That's, that's a really long answer to your story. That's amazing. But there's a lot to pull out. There's a lot to tease out of that answer. So, so, you know, what I hear from your answer is, you know, it's okay to pivot if you're not having fun you weren't having fun as an actress. And so, uh, but you were having fun working with words and you were tapping back into a love that you brought to editing already. You said mm -hmm. you were a word nerd, which yay, me too. <laughs> well, it's funny it, looking back now, I see that was probably what I always was more than anything else. Yeah. I think what drew me to acting was story, quite honestly. I was about to say love of story. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, also a value from from your answer is, you know, persistence, being coachable, um, <laughs> persisting, but intelligently <laughs> and and word of mouth, you know, starting with mm. one one little nibble, like, you know, with fishing and <laughs> going from there to, you know, all these other writers. And it was really smart of you to um, make that offer to to your friend. Um, it was probably the best business decision I ever made. I t she and I are very close now. And I tell her uh, I built my business on her back. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I love that. And uh, I don't know if your viewers know this, but you have done the How Writers Revise feature that I do on my blog. And in the mm -hmm. course of my expansion of that, you and I just did an interview where you talk about really similar things, persistence, mm -hmm. being coachable, churn, uh being able to change. And also, I love what you said about everything's connected in this business. 
Mm-hmm. And you've, you know, I love the stories. I don't want to spoil or anything, but the stories you've told <laughs> me about how you recovered from some setbacks in your career because of the people you had met in the writing community and all these interconnected um, connections, I guess, that you had. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, a network, a community. Um, mm-hmm. And I think that's, that's so important in life and um, in creating. So, and in such an isolating business as writing can be. Yeah. I mean, writers do have, you know, the image around writers is that, and this is partly true, that we're by ourselves, you know, in, in a library or a coffee shop or an attic room. Uh, I had a cousin, <laughs> a cousin who once told me, I, I imagine you someday in a garret in New York. I don't know why he said that. I never ended up in a garret in New York, eating, eating apple scraps, but typing away. Uh, and I, like, not unlike the life of an actor, it sounds like. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but there's, you know, it's kind of a goofy uh, before the internet kids image. But there's, but there all, all, also is a little bit of truth of that. You know that yeah. that you're creating at least initially that initial clay um, in isolation, and then you need to, you know, as a writer, you need to um, begin the revising and editing process. And you have a philosophy that, and I agree with it, um, that revising and editing is the heart of the writing process. I think sometimes people think writing is just letting it all spill out and typing it down or on, or on a keyboard or dictating it or, and then you're done. And then, right. you, you know, you do a you rip it off the check. typewriter and you send it to yes. your agent. <laughs> right. And then you're done. Not quite how it works. So talk about that a little bit, your philosophy about revising and editing and that's certainly part of your you know the heart of your book intuitive editing as the heart of the writing process yeah i think i think we do writers a disservice by sort of presenting a lot of the teaching a lot of the books presents it as if drafting is the writing process and i love that you talked about in your um i had asked you in the writers on revising feature to talk about your greatest challenge and and you sort of spoke to that 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 is really where you find the story I think drafting is where we get, um, that's where you get the bones of it on there. And Mm -hmm. then editing and revising. And uh, I always like to differentiate between the two of them because I I use them differently. And I think it's helpful for authors to define them differently. Editing is, I think of that as the assessing. That's Mm -hmm. looking at it and saying, what's actually on the page? What do I have? How's it coming across? Is it my intention? Is it the vision that I had? And revising is then taking the information you gleaned from editing and putting it into practice to address those areas. So I just, editing is assessing, revising is addressing. Um, And I don't think you can, even if you outline, even if you're a a plotter, you know, someone who plans everything out ahead of time, I think that the creative impulse takes us down avenues we, we may not have seen coming until we're actually on the road. That's right. And I also think that even if you do write it, even if you like conceptualize the whole thing step by step, and then you write that out as if you're transcribing it, there's so much more depth that you can dig out. There's so much more you can show. There's so much more you can reveal. There's so many more layers and texture that you can find in revising it. So I I think if authors, what I see authors often do is get really discouraged when their initial drafts need a fair amount of revision. But that's why I kind of want it to become known that this is what the work is. This is the process of it. And it's entirely normal. Yeah, it's entirely normal. And honestly, for me, it's it's where it becomes fun. I, you know, that draft that (laughs) that drafting process is um, I love the planning. And then how much do you plan? I plan a lot. Really? yeah, well, sort of. I well, I have to know. I think I have to know since I write mysteries. I think I have mm. to know who the killer is and and why. But um, for at least the first three kinship books, I got to within fifty pages of that first draft and thought, "Uh oh, that's not who the killer is." <laughs> ah, what do I do now? And what I did was I just kept going. And so finally, <laughs> by the time I got to the fourth book, The Echoes. Um, I thought, you know what, I'm just going to have, um, suspects and motives for each suspect. And then 
I'll get within 50 pages and hopefully I'll have an epiphany. <laughs> of, I love that. Is that more of, fun to write it that way? Uh, it was, it Is was it also, it was, it was scarier. I don't know that it was harder in some mm. ways it might've been easier. Um, but it was a little like, uh, having, still having the safety net below me of, cause I like to figure out a lot of the structure of a story. Um, and still having that safety net of, okay, you, you know, the motives of your main characters, you know, the motives of, you know, why they're interested in solving this crime, why it matters to the community, you know, all this stuff, but the holes are just a little bit bigger in the net at the bottom when, yeah. <laughs> when you're like, but I'm not sure who's really going to be the culprit at the end, but I think it, you know, it was, it was exciting. <laughs> but that's the other beauty to me of, realizing that editing and revision are such a key part of the process. No one has to see this thing until you're ready. That's so right. you can just edit, you know, you can revise it all you mm -hmm. want to until you feel that safety net is back under you again. That's right. And that's a good way to put it. And I do, I do tell myself, um, as I'm writing that terrible first draft, I don't even call it a first draft anymore. I just call it a raw draft. It doesn't even deserve <laughs> the word rough. It's just raw. <laughs> uh, I tell myself, you know, you're not doing heart surgery here. You're not mm -hmm. landing a plane. You're just creating a thing uh, that you're going to be able to work with later. You know, so that, I always that say helps. that we are uh, creatives, authors especially. We are the ones who continue to play make believe for our whole lives. Like this is, I agree. It's it can be hard, and I don't mean to imply that it isn't because I know how difficult editing and revision oh, yeah. and writing can be. Like, I hate first drafts too. They're such a slog. I wish somebody <laughs> would just give me my first draft so that yes. I could edit it because that's the right. cool part. Yeah. But I, I do think that um, realizing that that is such a big part of the process is very freeing and helpful. Yeah. It is freeing and helpful. And Catherine Kraft, who's a fabulous writer, has commented, Hello, I also love revision. <laughs> of course she does, editor Catherine Kraft. She was, uh, I did an editorial <laughs> summit about, oh, okay. I don't know, right after Nano last year, okay. because everybody's stuck at home, right, in the pandemic, right. and I figured it would be helpful for everyone who'd done Nano. Mm -hmm. And so Catherine was on it, and she was very eloquent about editing. Oh, that's wonderful. Okay. So, um, you mentioned Nano and everybody being stuck at home. And we've talked about mm. how hard it is to, to create the first draft. And, you know, there are challenges at every stage. So, so what are some tips that you might have for writers about how to stay inspired through the, the parts that are a slog that are, that are difficult? Well, it's a good question for the first draft. I love uh, one of my favorite books on craft is by Brenda Euland. And that thing, I swear I'm being literal here. I think it's a hundred years old now. And it's called If You Want to Write. Ooh, it's one okay. of the most beautiful books about the creative impulse and honestly author voice that I've ever read. It's all about connecting to what's true in your writing. And she, her phrase that I have stolen ever since, but she's dead. So I think it's okay. So it's okay. <laughs> is um, that she that you vomit it up onto the page. <laughs> I think that that to me is so incredibly helpful. I actually also keep a sort of a similar but nicer way to put it. Michael mm -hmm. Pollan, the food writer. Mm, um, okay. I read an article with Michael J. Fox where he was writing, I guess, his memoirs. And okay. you know, Michael Pollan is his brother-in-law. And he said his advice was velocity and the truth. Ooh. <laughs> which is a nice version of just Ooh. vomiting. I'm up making notes here. That's why I'm looking down. I love those two. And the truth. That's so just like you said, keep in mind that your first draft, no one ever has to see it. It can be as raw mm -hmm. as you need it to be. Mm -hmm. Just forgive me, puke that story up onto the page, <laughs> furiously write that thing, get it out and then go back and and see what you want to do to make it match the vision you had in your head. Now, I will say, um, as hard as drafting can be, and I don't know, Jess, if you'll agree with this, but I'd be curious to know. I think revising is much harder. What do you think? Um, can be. I, I should say can be. I think I think it can be. I, I think it's more fun. So in that sense, for me, it's more fun. Yeah. Um, so in it's that good, sense. It's good hard. It's fun yeah, hard. But. Yeah. It's a, it's a good it's a good hard. That's a good way to put it. Um, but yeah, it is hard. And and in your book, Intuitive Editing, you talk about the x-ray and taking apart the story. And so there's a lot of intense work that, mm -hmm. that 
that has to happen with that revision. Well, and when you're drafting, I think you're totally in that right brain creative mode. And mm -hmm. then when you, so editing is pretty left brain, but then revising is both. <laughs> you know, you've got it. <laughs> you have to be both analytical and creative at the same time. And that can be really hard. And the other hard part, of course, is that it's almost impossible to get that objectivity about your work as you're working yes. in it, that you need to see what it needs. That's why I separate. That's one big reason I separate out editing and revising also is because editing, you can get more objectivity. And I, I, I teach about how, and I talk about it a little bit in the book with revising, it's really hard to, so you have to rely on what you, what your editor brain gave you in that editing stage when you were objective. Yeah. And that trusting yourself is, mm. I know. Yeah. Challenge. Knowing when it's so subjective, right? Like, is this coming across the way I want it to, or is it, am I, do I just think it is because I'm feeling, cause I see it all in my head. Mm -hmm. This is when beta readers, crit partners, editors, your agent, all of those people are invaluable because they hold up the mirror. Yeah. And, and you can get too close. I know that's how I, I came to be part of your world and you became part of mine was, lucky me. um, uh, and lucky me with, with the widows, um, I'd gotten wonderful feedback from my agent, um, Elizabeth, and I'd gotten feedback from a couple trusted readers and I had done all the, the right things of, you know, you put it, the manuscript aside for a while and then you come back to it. So you're a little more objective and you can see, oh, you know, this part that I thought was terrible is actually pretty good. And this part that I thought was great, we're going to cut that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but at the same time, you know, at some point, Elizabeth said to me, we're both too close to this. We need we need somebody who's never looked at this before um, and, and get her take. And so she recommended you. And that was great because it was like a masterclass in point of view. And it was really interesting to realize um, for all the writing I've done and education I've had, and I, you know, I can define point of view that I didn't really understand point of view until you stepped me through. So oh, thanks. Well, you're because welcome. you're in it. And that's right. I mean, I'm glad you said that because I think sometimes authors take it. You even said this in our interview that when it was suggested to you, an outside editor would be helpful. Your first reaction <laughs> was, I should know how to do this. Right, right. That's not what it's about. It's not that you don't. Of course you do. You understand point of view. It's that when you're in the forest, it's hard to see the path out to the other side and you need someone who's got the drone view at that time. Yeah, exactly. But you could probably have done exactly what I was able to help you see in your book. You could probably do that with another author because you can see it in their book. You just can't, you're blind to it in your own. Well, and that's why I, I so enthusiastically agreed with your comment about, can't somebody just hand me the, the, the raw oh. draft and let me work on it? <laughs> yeah, because I'd know exactly what's wrong with it then. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, and you know, you coach writers through uh, the revision and editing process. And I'm sure, you know, every, every writer is unique um, and has his or her or their own um, challenges to work on. But how is coaching writers a little bit, or is it, maybe it's not, like life coaching? That's an interesting question. I don't actually think of what I do as coaching, but I do think it probably has those elements in it. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people conflate coaching and editing and they're very different to me. Coaching okay, okay. is about the creation process. Coaching mm -hmm. is like your, um, I don't know your, what's a good metaphor for it. <laughs> um, coaching is your acting teacher <laughs> who helps you get the part, right? They help ah. you perfect your craft so that in, this is in my mind. So, so that you can get the role so that you're a competent actor so that you become better at your craft, but mm -hmm. you still have a director who helps you with okay. a specific show or movie or whatever you're doing, who can, who has that big aerial view and can help you bring your story, your character, whatever it is, uh, whatever your field is fully to life. It does have a lot of coaching elements in it though, because there is, you know, it's, as we said a minute ago, it's a really intimate relationship. Mm -hmm. And because while a good editor shouldn't tell you what to do, um, mm -hmm. they should help you find the path toward what feels right for you to do. So it is kind of like, it's like, like I have a personal trainer now. So it is like my personal trainer. Yeah. I'm doing the work 
right? But he's sitting right. there going, no, I'm going to need you to do just three more. And three here's more. 10 more pounds. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> um, yeah. And I guess I, I guess I used the term, I see the difference that you're pointing out. But for me, <clears throat> working uh, with you and working with my, my editor, Catherine at uh, Minotaur, um, I try to take the um, suggest, you know, I'm getting suggestions for, for, for a very specific project, mm -hmm. but I try to take that mm -hmm. and internalize it and apply it as a writer in general to yeah. the next project. Yeah. And like where a, a coach isn't necessarily an editor, I think an editor can help you with the things a coach would help you with in that regard, because mm -hmm. you do, you learn by doing. And you're seeing, you know, you're right there, like you said, on a specific project, you are hands on seeing how these concepts could enrich your work and your craft. And then once you, I always say, once you see Waldo, you can't unsee him. So like, <laughs> you know, with point of view, yeah. you said as soon as you, as soon as it clicked and you could see it in your own work, you didn't need me anymore. <laughs> oh, well, uh, but that's, that's not necessarily true. <laughs> <laughs> but I do like what you said about it being like life coaching, I always think a joke that being an editor is like 80% editing and 10% cheerleading and 10% therapist <laughs> because we're having, because I don't think authors realize, or maybe they do, how much of themselves is revealed on the page. And so we, sometimes you have to find ways of like, if a character is abrasive, let's say, and you, and the, and the author's not seeing that it could be because that's the way they and I'm saying this pot calling kettle black because I can be a very direct sort of, some would say abrasive person. Um, I think that you have to find a way of, of just like in therapy, helping the mm -hmm. author see what is coming across on the page that they may not have intended that bled over from who they are. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that's, and also your characters, you know, like I'm a character editor. And so everything I do is based around character. Mm -hmm. To me, it's the heart of story. And so you do need to know quite a bit about human psychology, yeah. I think, as a writer, as an editor, as anybody who works with character. We're creating yeah. human beings. That's right. And they feel very real. <laughs> mm -hmm. They should. Yeah. They should. And they do to us when we're writing them, right? Yeah. And hopefully that magic happens when people read our work. Um so, you know, I said it, I said at the top that you, uh, you walk the walk, you write the right. Uh, so you write novels. Uh, I know your focus is uh, your, your first love and your focus is as an editor, but you also, and I think this, this is actually great because I think it makes you uh, more relatable, like mm -hmm. as a writer. Ah, okay. You know, she's, she's been through this from this side. <laughs> So you write novels as uh, Phoebe Fox. So if you wouldn't mind, you know, tell us a little bit about that. And no, you know, it's funny yourself. that you, it's, it's funny that you say you like that you think it adds to what I'm offering as an editor, because up until about a year ago, I kept those very separate and I mm -hmm. did not claim Phoebe <laughs> like openly. Phoebe was a separate entity and I kept her completely. <laughs> her, I still talk about it like it's a separate person. And I kept her completely separate from Fox print because as you said, well, the reason that I said, and it's true, is that editing is my first love, my passion. It's how I define myself. And I never wanted authors I worked with to feel as if they were my second focus. They're my first yeah. focus. But then I realized that there was also a component of my feeling, um, like when you told me you read one of my books, I was <laughs> It freaked me out because, <laughs> because I think I'm much more confident in my editing skill than my writing skill. And I was mm -hmm. always worried maybe authors would read something I'd written and think, well, why should I listen to her as an editor? She's not that good. Or that they might, it might not be their cup of tea and they might think, oh, she, she writes women's fiction. So she can't help me with my mystery, which does happen to be one of the genres I work in. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it started to feel a little inau inauthentic to me that I was denying Phoebe. <laughs> like it was, it was sort of, I wasn't showing my belly. Mm -hmm. um, and that felt it, like I'm up on the mountaintop going, here's what you do. And not really, not revealing that I'm also climbing up the mountain like every other <laughs> writer. So I came clean with it, but it, it was, 
scary at first, but somebody said to me just what you just said was that it makes, as an editor, it made them feel like, oh, okay, she's in the trenches too. So right. it turned out to be a positive when all this time I kind of thought it might be a, a detriment. But it turned out to be a positive. So tell yeah. me what I'm currently reading, Turn of the Key by Ruth Ware. Tell me what you're currently reading because you're also a lover of reading books. Oh, so much. So it, believe it or not, I read every single night, even though my husband laughs because I also read, you know, eight hours a day or more. Um, and right now I'm in a nonfiction place. Mm -hmm. So I'm rereading a book called Deep Work by Cal Newport that I just read. And I literally turned back to the beginning and started rereading it because it's about um, finding your unbroken focus. Mm -hmm. And in doing it, I realized how often my focus was fragmented. So it's made me ridiculously productive and I'm able to kind of uh, accomplish a lot, but also really get deep into stuff. I'm loving that. I just nice. started um, a few nights ago, I started A Promised Land, Barack Obama, mm -hmm. and I'm sort of midway through Hamilton by Ron Chernow. That's a much oh. slower read, but I did finish before this nonfiction jam I'm on started <laughs> in yeah. earnest. I just, the last thing I read was The Kindest Lie by Nancy Johnson. I loved oh. it. Have you read it? I haven't read it. She's so good with, it's a very uh, interwoven story with a lot of backstory that is necessary mm -hmm. to understand the story. And of course the editor in me is like, oh, cool. I love seeing how she did that. Yeah. So <laughs> she handled it so well and really creates um, faceted characters who have a rich tapestry of history that brings them even more to life. And it never, you know, even as much as she incorporates that, it never impedes the forward momentum of the story. Boy, that sounds like I'm clinically enjoying it. I enjoy a story <laughs> first on its own merits, but then the little editor brain starts picking apart why I liked it. Why Why did that work? Yeah. That, those were great suggestions. Well, anything else before we wrap up that you'd like to share with, with viewers now or viewers that will uh, watch this or listen to this on the podcast later? Two things. One, you thank you for putting my website up. I have so many resources for authors on there, most of them free. Mm -hmm. um, podcasts and blogs and resources for querying, uh, whatever, like tools. I have a self-editing checklist you can download. Mm -hmm. I have a, a guide for how to how to find a reputable editor and the right fit for your story. So please do visit me there. But I also want, can I leave with like my last little advice I try to give every time I do an interview? And that's just to remind authors to be kind to themselves because this uh, creatives are really hard on themselves. And, you know, one day you think you are, like you said a minute ago, one day you think, dang, that was good. I'm such a good writer. And then the next day you read the same thing and you are in the pit of despair Mm -hmm. And those are just those little demon voices that all creatives have. And so I think it's really important that we're our own best ally all the time. Oh, that's, that is great advice to end on. Thank you so much. And thank you thank for having you. me. And I love talking to you and I'm just sad there wasn't all those delicious recipes that are in your newsletter. <laughs> Something that I could enjoy with you like pie. Pie. Mm. Yes. Well, thank you for being with me and, um, having tea on um, tea with Jess and uh, everybody until our next tea break take take her advice be kind to yourself be kind to others take care of your loved ones and yourself and have fun mm -hmm.